Hello everyone and welcome to the historynetwork.org podcast. Season 27, episode 2, Quintus Sertorius, Reluctant Renegade, part 2. This episode was written by Liam O'Fuelan. Liam is a senior lecturer at the Cork Institute of Technology in the Republic of Ireland where he conducts research on photonics for applications in sensing and fibre optic communications. He received a PhD in physics from the University of St Andrews in Scotland in 2005 and has written over 90 articles for scientific journals. He is a keen student of history, particularly that of ancient Greece and Rome. Sertorius spent the winter training his Iberian troops and accustoming himself to their nature and tactics. He had a corps of veteran Roman legionaries who followed him through many battles. A small number of Iberians were heavy infantry armed in the Roman style, but the majority were light troops. At this time, the Roman legionary was equipped with a chainmail shirt and the Monte Fortino style helmet, which was designed to deflect the blows of Gallic and Iberian swords. A second layer of chainmail was often added to the shoulders to help receive the deflected blow safely. The legionaries fought in close ranks with a heavy shield and a short stabbing sword their armament completed with two throwing spears. It is important to note that in battles between heavy infantry, the casualty rate was very low, in stark contrast to the Hollywood portrayal. The legionaries were very well protected, and to kill or wound an opponent, it was necessary to find a chink or weakness in the armour, for example, when Julius Caesar fought Pompey at the Battle of Pharsalus, Roman legionaries fought for several hours with only comparatively few losses. The dramatic casualties were only incurred when one side broke and ran. Sertorius had a number of heavy Iberian infantry known as Scutati, who were equipped in similar style to the legionary. They made greater use of leather and hardened linen armour. The rest of his infantry were lighter troops with small shields and little armour and were guerrilla fighters par excellence. The Iberian cavalry was excellent with medium-sized horses who were perfectly adapted to the rough terrain of Hispania. Roughly 25% of the army was cavalry a relatively high fraction, and furthermore the Iberian horsemen often carried an infantryman behind the rider into battle. This made a big fraction of the army highly mobile. These factors gave Sertorius a number of advantages to work with. He introduced Roman formations and signals, and tempered the rash heroism of the tribesmen. He also took advantage of the superstitions of a tribal culture. When a white fawn was given to him as a present, he was able to train it to follow him around the camp, a remarkable achievement in itself. He started to give the fawn religious significance, claiming that it had revealed information to him in dreams. Whenever a messenger brought him good news, the man would be concealed until after the fawn had been paraded through the camp to herald a victory. With a blend of cynicism, fairness and respect for the local traditions, he made the Iberians devoted to him and they readily accepted levels of discipline comparable to a legionary army. The next campaigning season began with an advance by Domitus from the north, the trustworthy Hertelius met him and drew the Romans into the mountains before engaging them in battle. Domitus was killed in the battle, some of his army surrendered and the rest scattered. In the south, Lucius Thorius Balbus 
commenced operations prior to the arrival of Metellus. The destruction of Domitus's army left Balbus exposed, and Sertorius outmaneuvered and defeated Balbus, who was killed in the fighting. Metellus was accustomed to fighting with a solid block of heavy infantry in the classic Roman style. The elusive Iberian warriors, with their light armour and quick horses, were able to frustrate him, cutting the Romans off from food and even wood for campfires. The Roman historian Plutarch suggests that Metellus had grown soft and accustomed to luxury. Sertorius, though only five years younger, was tough and hard, and even challenged Metellus to single combat. The men were eager for a fight between generals, and when the Roman general refused, they mocked him. To combat the Iberian guerrilla tactics, Metellus established a series of forts and was reluctant to operate far from these. When he pursued Sertorius, he was exposed to constant ambushes and flank attacks. Sertorius chose not to attack the forts, but cut the Romans off from water and forage. In despair, Metellus called for help from Gaul. Hertilius, Sertorius's trusted lieutenant, met Lucius Manlius in battle, threw the relief force back and looted the Roman camp. Manlius was now left with no choice but to return the way he had come, retreating in disarray. Metellus was now forced to operate on his own. He decided to target the cities that had joined Sertorius, forcing Sertorius to come to their aid and meet the Roman heavy infantry in a pitched battle. Metellus chose Langobriga, a city that had an inadequate water supply inside its walls, and was therefore vulnerable to siege. However, Sertorius had a network of sympathisers who had infiltrated the Roman camps as servants, and he learnt of the plan even before the Romans marched. Using silver from the famous Iberian mines, he offered a generous reward to anyone who could carry water to the soon-to-be besieged city. Enthusiastic volunteers carried 2,000 water skins over the mountains, and when Metellus arrived, he found that his own supply situation was worse than that of Langobriga. He was forced to dispatch a legion to look for food, and when the foragers were a good distance from the army, they were attacked by 2,000 Iberians who had been concealed in a ravine. As the dispersed legionaries attempted to form up, Sertorius appeared and struck them from the rear. The legion disintegrated. The survivors trickled back to Metellus, who, with a demoralised army and lacking food, had no choice but to abandon the siege almost before it had begun. As 78 BC drew to a close, further good news reached Sertorius. The hated Cornelius Sulla had died. Though the Sullan faction still held power, one of that year's consuls, Aemilus Lepidus, attacked the dictator's legislation, creating turmoil and uncertainty in Rome. As this struggle played out, both Metellus and Sertorius adopted a conservative strategy. Metellus was frustrated by his recent failures, while on the other hand Sertorius hoped for a reconciliation with the Roman Senate. He could claim to be the last legally appointed governor of Hispania, who was simply defending his province against pro sulla rebels. The other consul was a die-hard supporter of Sulla. Tensions quickly reached a boiling point. Lepidus decided to take a second consulship by force and marched on Rome with the army of Lucius Manlius. The Senate, fearful of another civil war, declared Lepidus a public enemy and sent the new consul, who was aided by Pompey and his legions of loyal veterans, against him. Lepidus was defeated in a battle outside Rome, marking the end of his rebellion. He retreated to Sardinia, where he died soon after landing, leaving Perpenna Viento in command.
Perpenna and his army found themselves in a perplexing situation. Perpenna had been condemned to death by Sulla and could not return to Rome. The army, a considerable force of five and a half legions, had gone from being the official army of a Roman consul to a band of rebels. When Pompey was rumoured to be advancing against them, the army panicked and demanded that they join Sertorius in Hispania. Perpenna, who came from an old aristocratic family, must have been nettled at the thought of serving under Sertorius, a homo novus by Roman traditions. However, he had no choice but to acquiesce, and his army sailed to Hispania. Sertorius, no doubt disappointed by failure of Lepidus, was thus enriched with five and a half legions of precious heavy infantry. In the meantime, Pompey had been sent with an army to Hispania. This was a win-win situation for the Senate. If Pompey was successful, they regained Hispania, and if he disappeared into the quagmire that was the Sertorian War, they would be rid of a dangerous and brash young general who was widely regarded as having the potential to be another Sulla. Sertorius had made use of the respite to consolidate his hold on Hispania. Due to the tangled politics of the area, many tribes were hostile to him or his allies. One by one, he overcame them. He continued to train the Iberians and equipped many with captured Roman armour. The produce of Spain was no longer flowing to Rome, and Sertorius liberally provided his men with gold and silver, which they used to embellish their armour, shields and weapons. Sertorius's popularity grew due to his improvements in military tactics and discipline. But what earned him the most gratitude was his establishment of a school for the sons of noble families. There the boys were instructed by Greek and Roman teachers. While the children were hostages, the parents nonetheless were pleased to see the boys instructed in the high culture of Rome and dressed in the gowns provided by Sertorius. In 76 BC, Pompey arrived in Hispania, opening a new route across the Alps in the process. Sertorius moved his camp close to Pompey and maintained close contact constantly laying down challenges and continuing the guerrilla tactics that had proved so successful against Metellus. Pompey, unfamiliar with the dangers of this new war, sent a legion out to forage. Sertorius promptly isolated it and inflicted very heavy losses. Nonetheless, Pompey's reputation had preceded him. He had earned the cognomen Pompey the Great for his exploits, in the wars of Sulla. A number of cities were now considering switching sides. To combat Pompey's growing influence, Sertorius laid siege to the city of Lauron, a town roughly 80 kilometres from modern Valencia. The location was strategically important as it controlled the route between Metellus and Pompey. Once he became aware of the siege, Pompey moved with all his army to relieve the city. Sertorius had pitched his camp on a hill overlooking the city, and the confident Pompey positioned his camp so that Sertorius was trapped between him and the city. Both armies were twenty to 30,000 men in strength. Supplying such numbers with food was no easy feat. Pompey's men could forage in two regions, one close to his camp and one further off. Sertorius ordered his light troops and cavalry to harass the foragers in the closer area, while leaving those further away unhindered. To escape the expert skirmishers, the Romans naturally switched their foraging efforts to greater distances from the camp. When a large expedition went out, Sertorius sent six cohorts of heavy troops, six of light, and two thousand cavalry to ambush them. They attacked the heavily laden legionaries in waves, routing them. Too late, Pompey realised the danger and sent a legion to relieve the shattered foragers. As they formed up to meet the Iberians, Sertorius's concealed cavalry attacked them from the rear. Then the heavy Iberian infantry hit them from the front 
and Pompey's men broke. Pompey quickly called up his entire army to rush to the rescue. In a carefully choreographed move, the main force of Sertorius left their camp and offered battle. Pompey was caught between two fires. He could not leave Sertorius in his rear and rescue the isolated legion and foragers, and he could not attack uphill against Sertorius, who was in a strong position and possibly had numerical superiority after Pompey's division of his force. Pompey was forced to stand idly by and watch as his men were cut down. The people of Lauron watched the battle, observing Pompey's helplessness. They realised that the situation was hopeless and surrendered. Sertorius executed the leaders but spared the inhabitants. He did make an example of the city by sending the people into exile and burning the city to the ground. During the evacuation, one cohort of Perpenna's men ignored the standing orders and indulged in some rape and pillage. This was something that Sertorius would not permit, and the cohort, which already had a reputation for brutality, was executed to a man. There are no further reports of atrocities from Sertorius's army. By now, Pompey had lost a third of his army since his arrival in Hispania. Sertorius had, as he mockingly put it, given the schoolboy a lesson. It should be remembered that Pompey was in his mid-twenties and was very young for high command by Roman standards. All the same, while Sertorius was publicly dismissive of Pompey and gave the greater compliments to Metellus, he took fewer risks in battles with Pompey. Pompey extricated what was left of his force from the perilous situation by the ruins of Lauron and retreated to the river Ebro, where he remained for the rest of the year. His winter quarters were in a camp rather than a city, which did nothing to improve the morale of his men. Sertorius continued his efforts to bring and keep the Iberian tribes under his control. He had the difficult task of creating a common identity for a disparate set of tribes, who rarely thought beyond their local valley, while also acting as the legitimate Roman governor of a province that hated Rome. His tactics consisted of Romanizing the elite via the schooling of their children and by providing a fair government. He created a 300-man senate comprised of Roman exiles in imitation of Rome itself. Even so, it was his military victories that really earned him the love and respect of the Iberians. For all his fairness and exploitation-free government, real control of the province lay in his hands and those of the Roman aristocrats. At the beginning of 75 BC, Sertorius held control of most of central Iberia and some of the eastern coast. Metellus camped near the river Betis in the southeast, where he was faced by Hertelius and Sertorius. In the north, Pompey faced Perpenna close to Contrebia Balassica, a town recently taken by Sertorius's forces. Pompey and Metellus were under severe pressure. Previous Roman wars in Hispania had been self-financing thanks to victories and pillages. Now they relied on resources from Rome, the reserves of which were still stressed after the civil war. Rampant piracy encouraged by Sertorius further strained their supply lines. At around this time, Sertorius sent word to Metellus and Pompey, offering to lay down his arms and live a private life if he was allowed to live safely in Rome, saying that he'd rather be the meanest citizen in Rome rather than a supreme commander elsewhere. Despite their predicament, the Roman generals refused, as they both needed a victory to take back to Rome. As the campaigning season started, Pompey advanced and met Perpenna near Valencia. In the ensuing battle, Perpenna was crushed and lost 10,000 men, including his second in command. Pompey followed up his victory with the capture of Valencia and Sertorius rushed northward to retrieve the situation. The previously reliable Hertelius made matters worse by unwisely advancing on the camp of Metellus. Metellus, though outclassed by Sertorius, was a very able general 
and he followed Hannibal's tactics at Cannae in the ensuing battle. He withdrew the centre of his line while advancing his flanks. Hurt Elias had his best troops in his centre, and these were unengaged while their wings were driven in. Metellus continued his envelopment and drove Hurt Elias from the field with a loss of 20,000 men. These victories were just what the doctor ordered for the Romans and left Sertorius in a precarious situation. Pompey smelt blood and decided to gain a complete victory without help and thus claim all the glory. The two armies met again near the river Sucro. Sertorius, almost certainly weaker in terms of heavy infantry, delayed the battle until the late afternoon, considering that darkness would help his troops escape if the battle went poorly while the Roman army would surely disintegrate during a night retreat in unfamiliar territory. Both Sertorius and Pompey took personal command of the left wings of their respective armies. Pompey's wings started well and began to drive back the Iberians. Sertorius, becoming aware of this, rushed to his right wing, rallied the retreating men and encouraged the rest so effectively that they repulsed the Romans and routed Pompey and the left wing of his army. Pompey himself was almost captured in the disorder. He escaped only after cutting off the hand of an Iberian in hand-to-hand -hand combat, but was himself wounded, and he lost his horse. In the meantime, the Roman right wing had driven back the Iberians, facing them, and captured their camp. Sertorius arrived just as the Romans had begun pillaging and drove them off, killing many of them. The next morning, as Sertorius made ready to renew the battle, confident of victory, given the state of Pompey's army, he became aware that Metellus was approaching. Perpenna, commanding the rear guard, had been beaten again, and Sertorius was left with no choice but to withdraw. Pompey greeted Metellus with an uncharacteristic display of humility, conscious of how close he had been to defeat. Sertorius withdrew from the coast to restore morale. He blamed the setbacks on the absence of his white deer. Sertorius, who seems to have genuinely loved the creature, made a great scene when the deer conveniently reappeared. The soldiers of the ancient world, though hardened by tough lives and bloody battles, were seemingly moved by such omens and displays of emotion. True to form, the Iberian warriors were amazed by the reunion and escorted the pair back to camp, convinced that Sertorius was the favourite of the gods. Sertorius returned to his earlier tactics of interrupting the Roman supply lines and interfering with the foraging. Pompey and Metellus were soon under severe pressure to feed their men. To try to force a pitched battle, they began to plunder and pillage the countryside around Sergontia, 120 kilometres northeast of Madrid. They created a sufficient threat that Sertorius was forced to give battle, probably at the behest of his men. Pompey and Metellus maintained separate camps, which created an opportunity to defeat each in detail. The ensuing battle was particularly fierce. Sertorius initially drove Pompey back, killing 6,000 of his men, including his best lieutenant and brother-in-law, Memmius. Sertorius then switched his attention to Metellus and personally led a charge directed at the Roman commander. Metellus, who fought particularly bravely, was wounded with a lance. This wound to the aged commander both infuriated and inspired his men, who covered him with their shields and redoubled their efforts. Victory changed sides and the Iberians were driven back, with the loss of 5,000 men, including Lucius Hurtelius. Sertorius received reinforcements the next day and assaulted Metellus in his camp, catching him by surprise. It was only the timely appearance of Pompey that saved Metellus. With the battle stalemated, Sertorius withdrew and with a tactic common in guerrilla warfare, dispersed his army. To aid in their escape, Sertorius allowed himself to be cornered in the city of Clunia, in the mountains, the Romans concentrated on the city and prepared for a long siege. Once Sertorius received news that his army had reassembled and new forces raised, he sallied forth and broke through the Roman lines, inflicting heavy casualties. 
In the next year, Pompey and Metellus were reinforced with two legions. Now outnumbered in terms of heavy infantry, Sertorius chose to avoid pitched battles, which he did successfully. The guerrilla war waged on land and sea by the Iberians started to bite. The Roman supply lines were cut, and with their ability to forage almost non-existent, Metellus was forced to withdraw to Gaul, and Pompey wintered in central Iberia. His men suffered greatly. History records a plaintive letter sent by Pompey to the Senate, stating that he had spent all personal money on his men, and without help he would be forced to withdraw. Metellus despaired of defeating Sertorius in the field, and placed a bounty of a hundred talents and twenty thousand acres on his head. Sertorius's fame had spread across the Mediterranean, and about this time the king of Pontus, Mithridates, sent ambassadors to Sertorius seeking an alliance against Rome. Mithridates was another bogeyman for Rome. In 89 BC he had repelled an invasion by Rome and its ally Bithynia, but massacred 80,000 Roman civilians afterwards. Sulla inflicted heavy defeats on Pontus in 84 BC, but had been forced to conclude a peace treaty due to the pressures of the civil war. Mithridates had then recovered his strength and soundly beat an invasion by one of Sulla's lieutenants. He sponsored huge numbers of pirates which terrorised Roman shipping in the eastern Mediterranean. Now Mithridates wished to capture all of Asia Minor, present-day Anatolia, which included the Roman province confusingly called Asia, now eastern Anatolia, Bithynia and Cappadocia. He offered Sertorius ships and money if he would confirm his pretensions to these lands. Sertorius summoned his senate, who were eager to accept his offer. Sertorius, on the other hand, showed his true colours. Bithynia and Cappadocia were fair game. However, the province of Asia was Roman, according to previous treaties with Pontus. Sertorius could not be party to an alliance that lessened the territory of Rome. Mithridates was amazed at this refusal, but persevered and concluded a treaty in which he gave Sertorius forty ships and three thousand talents, a talent was about twenty-six kilograms of silver, in exchange for a general, some soldiers, and recognition of his claims on Bithynia and Cappadocia. Sertorius duly sent a Roman senator called Marcus Marius to the province of Asia, who liberated a number of cities, stating this was by the favour of Sertorius. In the final stage of the war, the situation was bleak for both sides. For the Romans, the war with Mithridates was raging. Spartacus was leading his famous rebellion on the Italian mainland, and piracy was rampant, which triggered a war with Crete. In Hispania, their armies had problems with basic logistics. Years of exploitation and mismanagement had brought trouble on many fronts. For Sertorius the war was at a stalemate, as he and Perpenna sparred with Metellus and Pompey, both sides now sufficiently skilful to avoid decisive defeats, but the countryside was being wasted as the armies passed this way and that. The lack of progress depressed the Romans in the Iberian army, many of whom deserted. Metellus picked away at the cities allied to Sertorius with some success, Pompey tried the same, but was twice bested with the loss of 3,000 men. For the final year of the war, our sources radically diverge. The historical accounts grow increasingly fragmented, and while the Sertorian War, as it was called, was a hot topic in the Rome of its day, only four histories survive. Of these, only the accounts of Plutarch and Appian are complete, with fragments remaining from Livy and Sallust. We will leave it to the listener to decide on which version to believe, though the fatal conclusion is the same in both. Appian paints a picture of despair in the Iberian army, with the folds of the Roman net drawing tighter around them. Inconclusive warfare and scorched earth tactics 
had devastated the countryside, sartorious after his countless years of brutal fighting, hard-fought victories and endless misfortune, fell into despair and gave himself over to heavy drinking and womanising while treating his people with increasing cruelty. Fearing for his safety, the high-born Papenna felt he had no choice but to overthrow his insane leader and gathered a band of conspirators. Plutarch, on the contrary, describes an Iberian quasi-republic that was stable and grinding down the starving Roman armies. The nobles were sufficiently secure in their prospects that they felt able to indulge in some infighting. The ambitious and embittered Perpenna dreamt of sole command and stirred up the Roman exiles against the Iberians and Lusitanians. He ordered his men to persecute the local population who rose in rebellion. Sertorius, unaware of the provocations, sent some of Perpenna's conspirators to restore the peace, who did nothing of the sort. As the situation deteriorated, Sertorius became exasperated by the string of setbacks. Acting with uncharacteristic cruelty, he came down hard on the rebels and executed the hostage children he had been raising in Oscar. Perpenna's conspiracy grew in strength, and Sertorius began to catch wind of trouble. Perpenna accelerated his plans and arranged a banquet which he convinced Sertorius to attend. The party grew rowdy, irritating the temperate Sertorius who made ready to withdraw. Perpenna gave a signal and the first assassin struck Sertorius. He rose to fight but was pinned down and repeatedly stabbed by the conspirators. Pompey had no trouble dispatching Perpenna in the next campaign and his star resumed its previous meteoric rise. He would become one of the great men of Rome, reclaiming the Mediterranean from the pirates and finishing off Mithridates. In the rest of his campaigns, Pompey was the master of logistics and owned many of these skills that he painfully learnt whilst trying to feed his men in the mountains of Spain. So ends the tale of Quintus Sertorius, with a ragtag band of tribesmen and refugees, he fought the legions of Rome to a standstill, and possibly to victory. He was a controversial figure in his day due to his connection to the atrocities of Marius and the defeats he inflicted on Rome's chosen sons. As Roman historians never dwell on Roman defeats, Sertorius was largely written out of history, and his story had to be pieced together from the biographies of those he fought. To the end of his days, Sertorius had been a loyal Roman and dreamed of returning home to a life of tranquillity and peace. Unlike Marius and Sulla before him, and Pompey and Caesar afterwards, it was only the vagaries of fate and a cruel civil war that had forced him to fight his own people. Had fortune smiled upon him, he would be counted among the all-time great military leaders Instead, he spent his life commanding strangers against the greatest power of the ancient world. His full story is lost amongst the fragments of ancient history books and the dusts of time. Well, thank you, Liam, for writing that amazing great two-parter about Quintus Sertorius Reluctant Renegade. If you've enjoyed that episode and want to become a patron, then please do go along to patreon.com forward slash the history network and you can sign up to become a patron there. Thanks again for listening. You've been listening to the History Network dot org podcast written by Liam O'Fuela, read by Nick Barker. 